Good morning, John Safari. I want to welcome all of you. Thanks for being here today on our campus here in our activity center. Might have some over in Overflow. Got people at their homes, people cutting the grass, people, people doing all kinds of things. We're grateful for all of you uh, joining us this morning. If you're new to Johnson Ferry, it is a huge, huge honor to have you here. You are um, so welcome here, and we hope that this is a place that you will find and connect with people and just see the heart of Jesus. Uh, we're certainly not a perfect church, but we serve a perfect God, amen? And uh, it's grateful to be a part of this great church. We're so excited about Easter, two weeks away, starts Holy Week, so many things that week, and then, of course, that Saturday night. hope you guys will come to our Saturday night service or Sunday morning service on Easter Sunday. Um, it's going to just be a great weekend, so so excited about that. But today, we are jumping right back into this series, Follow Me, and we're going to look at Mark chapter 10. So I hope you brought a Bible with you. We encourage everyone to be bringing Bibles every single week, whether that's a digital one, just something you can take notes on, right? Just don't rely on the big screens up here, but something that you can take notes on. Mark chapter 10, and we're going to jump into verse 17 in just a second. What's in it for me? That's a question that we all ask subconsciously every single day. It dictates where we buy clothes, you know, what's in it for me? Who's got the best deal for me? It, it dictates what restaurants we go to, what coffee shop we go to, you know, what, what's in it for me? I, I want something, right? I have a particular need, I need you to meet it. And that's kind of what drives us. We think about our kids going to school, you know, what's in it for me? A lot of you are looking for churches based on that question. What's in it for me? What do you have for me here? How, what, how do I benefit from, from being here? And I'm not even saying that's a bad question, because sometimes that's a very good question, but it is, it is such a dangerous question because that's what, that what's in it for me mentality seeps into everything, and if you're not careful, it seeps into you following Jesus. And that's where the rub is. In Mark chapter eight, we read it a few weeks ago, Jesus says this to someone who wants to follow him. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me. To, to appropriately follow Jesus means to try to eliminate the question, what's in it for me? Because it's really not about you. In fact, the you part of you is supposed to die and the new part of you through Christ is supposed to live. And that's what the gospel is. Jesus Christ died on a cross, was buried, rose again three days later as he forgave you of your sin and defeated Satan, hell, death, the grave, and was resurrected so that we might have the promise of eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the good news, this life-changing reality of Jesus. And the great thing is you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be so good of a person that God will just have to give it to you. That is the exact opposite of the gospel. The gospel is free, and we receive his grace through faith. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and that, yeah, you should clap for that because that's the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus. And here's the deal here's the deal. Salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. That's the rub. Salvation is free, but once I begin to follow Jesus, he wants everything. And throughout the Gospel of Mark, we've seen fishermen give up their fishing business to follow Jesus. We've, we've seen tax collectors give up their tax collecting booth to follow Jesus. We've seen men and women give up comfort and safety to follow Jesus. Salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. Now, we're going to look today at a story that I bet a lot of you have heard. It's a story that deals with a rich young ruler. It's a story that's often communicated when talking about money. And we're going to talk a little bit about money today. I think you're thinking, oh, no, you kidding? I invited my friend to church. Today, you're going to talk about money? <laughs> yes, we are going to talk about money. <laughs> and I'm going to use your friend's name the whole time. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Actually, to, to be fair, money is really just a, a fruit of something much deeper. This is not really a text about money, though we're gonna talk briefly about money. 
It's a text that's really about surrender. And it's about what it looks like to follow Jesus. So as we read this text, I, I want you to think about what are the costs of following Jesus, but, and here's the other side, I want you to think about what are the benefits to following Jesus? Because if all we ever do is talk about the cost, that feels a little bit like telling you you need to eat your broccoli at dinner. <laughs> or if, if when it, you talked about your marriage and you said, you know, what's it take to have a great marriage and all you talked about was sacrifice and duty, that, that is a part of any great relationship, but the benefits far outweigh the cost. We could do that for a number of things in life. So yes, there are costs to following Jesus, but there are some amazing benefits. And I want you to see both in this great text. So in honor of God, wherever you are engaging us right now, would you stand together and let's read Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 31. 17 through 31. So as he, Jesus, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man came up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? But Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus showed love to him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But he was deeply dismayed by these words and he went away grieving for he was one who, owed, who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus responded again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to him, then, then, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and have followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Father in heaven, there are a lot of people here this morning who are first, who you will one day treat as last. But there are also those who are last that one day you will treat as first. Father, may we be said of being in the second group. And we'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. We've talked about the cost to following Jesus, but today I want to talk to you about the cost of not following Jesus. I say it this way, what's the cost of non-discipleship? In other words, if, if we choose to say no to Jesus, if we choose not to follow Jesus, what's the cost to that? What are we giving up if we say no to Jesus? I, I know that this story we're looking at has a lot of the cost to following Jesus, but this story is also laced with the benefits of following Jesus. So today we're looking at what happens if you say no to Jesus? What do you give up? There are a couple different things. Let's look at those together. Here's the first thing, if, if we don't follow Jesus, the cost or what we give up, we give up eternal life. We give up eternal life. In fact, isn't that what happens? 
Let's look at the first part of this, verse 17 through 22. This is where Jesus encounters this rich, young ruler. Now, Mark here tells us that he is rich. He had lots of possessions. He doesn't mention that he's young or that he's a ruler, but when we look at the other gospels, Matthew and Luke, we have a more complete picture. He's rich, he's young, and he's, he's a ruler. Now, isn't that interesting, by the way, that those are some of the three, those are three of the biggest idols that we chase in our culture today. Are you young? Do you have a lot of money? And do you have a lot of influence? So this is someone that epitomizes what many people are striving for in our life, in our world today. And he, and he comes up to Jesus and it says in verse 17 that he's eager, he kneels before him and he asks him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He thinks, like so many people, that the way you get eternal life is by earning it, doing enough being a good enough person. A lot of you right now think that the way you get on God's good side is to do a lot of good things for him and maybe he will let you into heaven. And that could be no further from the truth. I mean, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that there's nothing that you can do to earn salvation. Jesus earned it for you. And like receiving a gift, when you put your faith in Jesus, all of that he accomplished is transferred to you. That is the gospel. But this young man who probably grew up under the Jewish law, who knows the law, he thinks, if I can just do enough, then I'll have eternal life. And we get the sense that, he's, that he's, he's sincere. So many people in the Gospel of Mark try to trap Jesus, try to get him in a corner, try to prove that Jesus is wrong, that he doesn't know what he's talking about. But, but the impression we get of this young man is that he legitimately wants to follow Jesus. And he, he kneels before him and says, good teacher, what must I do? And then in verse 18 and 19, Jesus asks him a question. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus is not, by the way, saying he's not God. In fact, if you look through the rest of the Gospel of Mark, there are plenty of examples of Jesus demonstrating why he is God. I think what Jesus is saying, look, if you know the law, you know the only good, only God is good. So let me ask you a question. Why do you call me good? In other words, am I God to you? And then Jesus, because this young man knows the law, he says, well, then, you know, do the law. And then he quotes a bunch of the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony. And then Jesus adds one here. Do not defraud, and then honor your father and mother. All f those are six commands, five of which are in the Ten Commandments. But Jesus adds one, don't defraud. Now, now, why is Jesus adding one? Maybe because we see where this story is headed, this must have been an issue for this young man. And Jesus wants him in verse 21 to do something. It says in verse 21, looking at him, Jesus showed love to him. Let's pause there. So whatever Jesus is about to do or say, it is rooted in his love for this young man. Looking at him in his heart, loving him, this is what he asked this young man to do. He says in verse 21, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. That's all you gotta do. You wanna follow me? Then sell all your stuff, give it to the poor, and then come on, come follow me. Now, how, how ironic is it that just a few verses earlier in verse 13, Jesus looked at a bunch of kids who have no money, and he said, the kingdom belongs to such as these. And then he looks at this young man who has everything that everyone else wanted, and yet he, is, he has missed the kingdom of God. Jesus wants him to have treasure, but he wants it to be heavenly treasure. In fact, Jesus would say that in Matthew chapter six. Don't, don't store up your treasure where, where earthly things can make it go away like moth or rust but store up your treasures in heaven. Then Jesus says something in Matthew 6. He says, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, this is what Jesus knows about our heart. The way we discover where our heart is is to look at our treasure. In fact, if, if, you, if you went online and you downloaded and printed me off a copy of your, your bank statement, I can look at probably 20 to 30 of your transactions and tell you where your heart is. And you could do the same with me. Why? Because your heart is wherever your treasure is. 
So Jesus wants him to have treasure. He wants it to be heavenly treasure. And then he says, then come on, come and follow me. You, you want all that I have to give you? Come on, just get rid of it and come follow me. And you would think this, this young man so eager to want to follow Jesus would say, yes, Jesus, whatever you want. But is that what he does? Verse 22, but he was deeply dismayed by these words and he went away grieving. Why? For he was one who owned much property. One uh, scholar, a commentator I was reading this week and studying this passage, this is what he said about this young man. I thought this was telling. He said, as long as the man stands on his own merits, he is self-assured. But the word of Jesus calls him beyond his safe haven, just as it earlier called disciples to weigh anchor and cast into the deep where there is no security but only Jesus. Step out. I'm not trying to give you security. I'm trying to give you myself. Come and follow me. And he gave up eternal life because he couldn't get rid of it. Now, here's the interesting thing, that we, we don't have a lot of other instances in the New Testament where Jesus asks anyone to do the same thing. If you're asking, does that mean that I, I have to give up every dollar I have to follow Jesus? And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, certainly God gave it to you, it's all his. He wants us to be a good steward, a good manager of it. But Jesus looked at this man and he saw into his heart, looking at him intently with love, and he said, this has an issue in your heart, give it up, and then come follow me. And so here, here if we could just be real honest, we all struggle with sin generally, all of us, me too. But if Jesus were to look into your heart directly, what would he tell you to give up? I'm not talking about your neighbor, the person down the road from you, I'm talking about you. What is Jesus asking you to surrender to him? It could be a, a dozen things, I, I don't know. Is it your career? Is it your image or beauty? You're, you're so concerned with looking perfect in the eyes of everyone else and Jesus is going, I'm, I'm more concerned about your heart than about the way you look to people. Give all that up and come follow me. Maybe it's wealth, maybe you're like this rich young ruler. If you can just get another zero in the bank account, if you can just get that bigger house, get that nicer car, get that, whatever, all that stuff and Jesus is going, would you, just, would you just stop pretending like that will bring you meaning and come follow me? Maybe it's lust. Jesus is going, you, you are so concerned with, with, with lusting after people, just surrender that and follow me. Maybe it's, maybe it's dating. If I just find the right person to be in a relationship with, and Jesus is going, would you, would, you, would you just stop chasing that and start chasing me? Maybe it's alcohol. A couple years ago, you came home and you just took a drink or two, you know, kind of relaxed for the day, and now it has consumed your life, and Jesus is going, get rid of it and come and follow me. I don't know what it is, but if Jesus were to look into your heart right now, what's he asking you to surrender? Because the thing is, if, if we're not willing to give up everything for Jesus, it might mean that we don't actually know Jesus like we think we do. Now, we don't know what happened to this young man in the story. He, he, he goes off and who knows, maybe the next day he came back to say, I'm saved. Maybe a year later he was saved. Maybe, maybe he never, we don't know. But the picture of this moment is that when Jesus said, come and follow me, he would not give up everything. And you know what the cost he had to pay for that was? He missed eternal life. What about you? Do you know Christ? Well, here's the second thing. If, if we say no to Jesus, you know what else we give up? We, we give up experiencing God's power, experiencing his power. And, and the way I get that from is in verse 27, because he's gonna talk about wealth, and then he's gonna say all things are possible with God, just like he told the man in Mark 9 last week that had the son who had to be healed, and, and Jesus says, do you believe? And he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And, and Jesus tells him all things are possible with God. The same thing is said right here in the context of money. All things are possible with God. And see, if we say no to Jesus, we miss out on the amazing ways that God works. And often, often it will come through our pocketbook. 
So as we back up in verse 23, Jesus looks around his disciples. And, and I wonder, by the way, if the disciples are thinking, Jesus, man, we really blew it. I mean, that guy, that's who we want. We want people like that. We need influencers. He's got lots of Instagram followers. We, we need this guy. He's got money. He's got youth. He's got power. He wants, you know, he's saying all the right things. He knows the Bible. About. This is the kind of guy, Jesus, that we want. And you're just going to let him walk away like that? And Jesus looks at his disciples while the man is walking down the road and he makes this statement, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. His disciples, who might have agreed with that young man more than they're willing to admit, (laughs) were amazed at his words. And Jesus responded again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Salvation is free, but it will cost you everything. Jesus here is not putting up a standard to get into heaven that is unattainable. Again, we are saved by grace through faith. But unless we're willing to lay it all down, we probably don't really understand the gospel. And he says how hard it is. He's not saying that wealthy people won't enter the kingdom of God. He's saying, look, the wealthy people have a unique pressure that other people don't have. Because money has a way of gripping your heart in a way like few other things. And that's why he says that statement in verse 25, this idiom. He says, in fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And see, none of y'all laughed, but I think that was supposed to be funny. It's like him saying, you know, it would be easier for a 747 to fly through the hole of a Cheerio than for a wealthy person to get, see, you laugh, right? That was it, that was the whole point. He's saying, look, those two things don't mix. You can't get a big old animal through the eye of a needle. And and he's saying like this, you, you don't come to the gospel with anything but your sin and the need to be forgiven. And then you give your life to Jesus and you watch him change it. And that includes money, that includes money. So I'm looking out at a bunch of rich people, and so am I. We live in one of the more affluent places in the most affluent country in the world. So what, what does the Bible say about money? I, I could spend a lot of time on this. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna breeze by a few just key points about wealth, money, and possessions in the Bible. I'll have them on the screen. You can go back to our YouTube channel or something and watch these if, you wanna, if, if I talk too fast. But I just wanna breeze by a couple things so important and we're gonna see how this view of money sets up how we live a life that pleases Jesus. So here, here's a few things to know about wealth in the Bible. Number one, the Old Testament often portrays wealth as a sign of success. So you read in the Old Covenant, one of God's promises to Israel was, was blessing, and that often came in, in the form of financial prosperity, which is, by the way, why so many prosperity teachers today will pull back Old Covenant verses to justify their opinions, but it's interesting, we look at the New Testament, the mark of God's hand on someone is often strength in the midst of suffering. But in the Old Testament, there are plenty of examples of people who are blessed by God financially. And that's maybe why the rich young ruler was confused, maybe that's why the disciples are amazed at this statement, because they grew up thinking, the more I please God, the more he will bless me financially. Number two, what do we see about wealth in the Bible? Jesus often sides with the poor. I'm not, I don't know what to do with that all the time, but Jesus often identifies with the marginalized, with the poor. And we need to be careful that we, many of whom are not poor, do not unfairly label the poor as all being lazy or worthless in the same way that those people who are rich don't wanna be labeled as greedy or anything else. And just realize that your savior spent a lot of time with the poor and talking about caring for the poor. Number three, wealth is morally neutral. Are you more spiritual because you have $1,000 in your bank account versus having $100,000 in your bank account? Those zeros are not positive or negative, they just are. Wealth is morally neutral, it's what you do with that wealth. There are a lot of rich people in the Bible. Joseph of Arimathea, who let Jesus use his tomb, was a rich man. There are plenty of other examples of rich people in the New Testament. But number four, let's be honest, greed grips us more 
than we like to admit. None of us would say we're greedy, but a lot of us are driven by money in a way that does not please the Lord. Think about it, every time do you, that you get a raise, is your first thought something you can do for you or something you can do for God with that raise? And so you wonder, well, how, how do I not be greedy? Well, number five, generosity is the antidote to greed. You don't stop being greedy by just saying, God, I'm not greedy anymore. You stop being greedy by starting to give, starting to be generous. And which is so interesting because here, here's the thing, look, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you think, look, all you church people do, all y'all talking about money, I'm here I am again, here you are up there on the stage talking about exactly what is gonna happen, you're talking about money. Can I just tell you something about God? Let me tell you something, you look right here, God does not need your money. You think he needs your money? You think you sweat the economy in heaven? Are we gonna make budget this year? So if God doesn't need your money, why does he talk so much about money? Generosity is not something God wants from you, it's something he wants for you. He, he wants you to learn the heart of his son. He wants you to learn what it's like to give. He wants you to learn what it's like not to hold on to the things of this world and to trust him more than, than your bank account. And number six, so important, you will one day give an account to God. God will ask you what you did with the money and why you did what you did with the money. And by the way, let me give you a secret. He already knows the answer. So money is so important, and I would just encourage people who are parents. You know, I hear so many parents, and they talk about their kids, and they... And they they, they paint success for their children like, if you can just get into a good college, get good grades, get a good job, and make good money, then you will be successful. What a pitiful vision for life. If you're a follower of Jesus, that is way too low of a definition of success. Success is about advancing the kingdom. Success is about making Jesus' name known. Success is about changing the world for Jesus. If you make a lot of money, great, make a ton of money and then use it to advance the kingdom of God. Because see, if, if, if we just hold on to money and let, gener- let you know, greed grip our heart like it did this young man, yes, it might mean that we're not saved. It might mean that we lose eternal life. But you know what else you miss? You miss just experiencing the power of God work in your life and seeing how he can take that money and transform it and change the world. There's so many amazing things about following God and just seeing the stories of him at work. I mean, this last year, I know we celebrated on the video that the baptism that we've seen here, the life change that we've seen here, but all over the world, God is at work. It is amazing. You know, we invest money in, in, in places as a church and we see God doing amazing things. Why? Because we give. In fact, there's a story, I'll just give you a picture real quick. Lee Pak, he's one of our partners in India. They're planning hundreds of churches in COVID. And, and here's a story right here. You see all these pictures, 180 people in a village a couple months ago going down to a river to be baptized because there was a miraculous healing and they all want to give their life to Jesus. And, and that kind of stuff is happening around the world. God is at work. And we often have such a limited view because we're more concerned with what's in it for me instead of seeing where God is at work. And, and, and if, we, if we say no to Jesus, we miss his amazing power. All right, well, third and finally, if we don't follow Jesus, we give up eternal rewards. At the end of the story, Peter looks at Jesus, and, and I don't know if Peter says this as Peter often does, kind of just remind, you know, Jesus, what he's done for Jesus. I don't know if that's the tone or it's more of a concern like, hey, you know, we've, we've left every. I don't know, but, but Peter says, behold, we, we've, we've left everything. We've, we've, we've left everything and have followed you. And in a word of comfort and in a word of future hope, he, he says to him, Peter, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father, or children, farms for my sake or for the gospels, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, farms, 
but also persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Many people think what Jesus is saying here is that when you come to Christ, you, you come into a family. You know, a church is not just about a preacher and singing on Sunday morning. It's about being a part of a family. And here's the thing. When you come to Christ, you have more in common with a brother or sister in Christ who lives halfway around the world than you do with your blood relative who is not a Christian. Did you know that? And Jesus says, I'm gonna give you a whole family. I'm gonna give you mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. You might get kicked out of your house, but I'm gonna give you 10 other people who let you stay in their house. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you 100 times more if you'll just follow me. And yeah, there's gonna be some persecutions, but it'll be worth it. I, I wanna introduce you to somebody today to close out our time together. It's a man from Christian history, and, and we probably don't talk enough about Christian history. If you wanna learn something about following Jesus, Read some biographies of some great men and women who have followed Jesus, who are now dead, and we can, you know, we know how their story ended. But one such man who is really just a hero is, is a guy by the name of Charles Thomas Studd. Isn't that a great name, Studd? <laughs> What's your son's name? Studd. All right. Charles Tom, Thomas Studd. Th this guy right here, you can see his picture, and he, he was a world-class cricket player. I, I'm not gonna even pretend to know how to play the game of cricket, but, this, but this, this dude is like an amazing cricket player. Not just like good for his school, but world-class good. You think about one of the best athletes in the world today, and that would epitomize what this guy was in the mid to late 1800s in Britain. An amazing cricket player, grew up fabulously wealthy. Father had an indigo trade, just made a ton of money. Grew up prestigious schools, all the best, you name it. And then one day his dad went to hear D.L. Moody, one of my favorites of all time, Dwight Lyman Moody, an evangelist for, for Christ. His dad got radically saved. I mean, not just like kind of saved, but I mean radically saved. And his whole life flipped upside down for the, for the better. And so his dad would then make this ministry of inviting speakers and missionaries and pastors and just you know, Christian business people to his house all the time. He'd invite people over and they'd just have these kind of dinner parties and the dudes would share the gospel and people would get saved. Well, one day, Mr. Studd has three of his sons home from college and there's a speaker there and that speaker who has a heart for the gospel corners all three of those boys different times, leads all three of them to Christ. So now, just like their dad, they're radically saved and it changes everything. And so they go back to college with this renewed heart for sharing Jesus, this renewed heart for following Jesus, not giving to the pressures of the world like so many of you do at college, but they're gonna say, I'm all in for Jesus, whatever it takes. And, and so much so that they give up these aspirations of a career to go to the mission field. And there were about seven of them. They called them the Cambridge Seven. And they went all over the world, specifically to China, to share the gospel. And so, so C.T. Studd, who is this, this world-class athlete, rich kid, goes to the mission field to China. And, and the guy just loved Jesus. In fact, one of his quotes, I love it, he says, some want to live within the sound of church or a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Come on, that is, that is what I'm talking about right there. Well, when he's 25, his father dies. He's living in China at this point. He's married now. His father leaves him what would be the equivalent of about $5 million. So he's a good businessman. He knows how to, you know, Make ends meet, of course, $5 million. And he and his wife pray about it and they give it all away. They give a bunch of it to different ministries, D.L. Moody, Salvation Army. They'd be in China, would leave after about 10 years and would give the rest of the money to the Chinese ministry there, basically divested of all of their financial resources and just decide we're gonna live on faith and trust the Lord. And he did. And this man, C.T. Studd, he, he, he was used by God all over the world. He went to China for about 10 years. He got sick. He had really bad asthma. He came back to the United Kingdom, but then felt 
that he wanted to be on the mission field, so the Lord led him to India. He went to India and served there about six years, came back. At this point, he's about 50 years old, pretty sick. He was walking down the street one day and he saw an advertisement for going to Africa. And at, the point, at this point, Africa was this kind of, you know, wonder world with safaris and business prospects and, and all kinds of people want to go to Africa for all those reasons, but no missionaries were going to Africa. And he said, God, send me to Africa. And so he went to Africa. But before he went, his doctor told him, if you go to Africa, you're so sick, you'll be dead within six months. So he went. He got really sick, lost all his teeth, but served there for 21 years. You can see a picture of him here in a hut in Africa, and um, there he is serving the Lord for the rest of his life. And he he wrote down a couple things, and I'll I'll read these, and we'll wrap it up here, but here you have the picture. This this is the rich young ruler who said yes. And, And at the end of his life, he was writing down what he was most proud of when he looked back at his life lived for Christ. And here are the three things he wrote down. Number one, God called me to China, and I went in spite of utmost opposition from my loved ones. Don't waste your life. Don't give up your money. What about your career? But he said yes to Jesus. Number two, he said, I joyfully acted as Christ told the rich young ruler to act. I love that. The gospel gripped his heart, and he saw himself as the rich young ruler who said yes to Jesus. And number three, I gave up my life for this work, not for the Sudan only, that, that's the Africans, not for Africa only, but for the whole unevangelized world. He saw himself as a pioneer that other young men and women would follow and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. He said this about himself, I will blaze the trail in Africa, though my body may only become a stepping stone that younger men may follow. He wrote a poem that he's often quoted with, and one of the lines is this. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We've said it a bunch of times this morning. Salvation is free, but it will cost you everything. So here's the real penetrating question. What am I doing for Christ that will last? When you think about your life, your money, your career, your family, your aspirations, honestly, what are we doing for Christ that will last? Father in heaven, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you that salvation is free, but we also recognize there's a cost. It's a cost of laying it all down to you. Father, in a text like this, we need to be reminded that you are better. You're better than our dreams, you're better than our hopes, you're better than money, you're better than our career, you're better than our image, you're better than our sports and hobbies. Lord, you're, you're better than anything we chase after. And Lord, forgive us when we chase after temporary things that mean nothing, nothing in eternity. So God, I pray that we would chase after you, that we would love you, Father, you know the hearts of the people in this room, the hearts of people watching. Maybe right now you're convicting people of sin, and I pray right now they would confess that sin to you, that this thing has gripped their heart. And they would say, Lord, I surrender that to you. Maybe there's someone here today, Lord, who has never really given their life to Christ. They're like the rich young ruler. They know a lot about the Bible. They know a lot about being a good person but they've never really laid it down to follow you. And would today be the day they would stop playing church and stop playing around with religion and say yes to Jesus. God, maybe there's someone here today who like C.T. Studd, you are calling to the mission field. You're calling to go to the nations. And they are more concerned about their family's opinions and their career than they are about following you. God, would they follow your voice and your lead and your spirit? And would they say yes to you? Lord, salvation is free, and though it costs us everything, 
It's worth it. Why? Because you are better. We'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.